So please welcome to the chat. She's going to talk about password management. I'm kind of looking forward to that one. And yeah, you know, how I would love to give my passwords, or I am doing them. And this is the first academic echo presentation for today, so take it away. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Spielberg, I'm a postdoc at ETH today. Uh, this is work done in my PhD student at Carleton University in Ottawa. And Everyone in this room is intimately familiar with the difficulties of passwords. Um, passwords are hard to choose. We're told to choose random, secure passwords. Um, this is really, really hard to pick. If we do manage to pick them, those are really hard to remember. Um, and then finally, it's really difficult to keep track of having large numbers of accounts, large cor correspondingly large numbers of passwords that go with them. Um, and I'm sure this has happened to most, if not all of us, where there's, we sort of assume that because security experts are experts in security, we must know how to manage a password. But the thing is, the problems with passwords are more related to the dominant abilities of humans. So, do these problems, these password problems, affect um, experts as well? Are experts better at managing passwords? So, the research question in this work was, how do experts cope with the tasks of password management? And the goal, we conducted uh, a series of interviews, and the goal of our interviews was to better understand the practices of computer security experts around passwords. Do passwords, do experts rely on similar coping strategies? What kind of tools, what kind of techniques do experts use for password management? Um, what makes experts different from non-experts? And what can we learn from the practices of experts to um, inform what we tell non-experts? This is follow-up work to an earlier interview study I did where I explicitly focused on non-experts. So throughout my talk, I'm going to do a bit of comparing and contrasting with that earlier work. But what do we already know about coping strategies? We know that many, many users reuse passwords. This is a simple strategy, it's intuitive, and it scales beautifully. It has obvious security Um I can't think of a copy study that does not have a password. Um, in 2014, Gas et al. looked at data sets um, and tracked user IDs between them and found that something like 43% of passwords were reused between multiple websites. Um, so this is obviously not anecdotal. People are doing this a lot. Another thing that people do to cope with the difficulties of passwords is to write them down. And we could probably debate the security vulnerabilities of doing this. Um, but one thing that's clearly going wrong is that many end users particularly are not adequately protecting their recorded password lists. Um, a 2011 study found that people are 18 times more likely to write down unique passwords than passwords they've reused. This is obviously a strategy that's being used for some different passwords. There hasn't been a ton of work on security experts versus non-experts, um, but what there has been seems to suggest that um, experts and non-experts focus on different parts of the problem. Um, there was a recent study published at Soups this summer, a survey study that looked at sort of general security practices, and um, it found that experts uh, mentioned unique passwords. Um, it me they mentioned things like installing security updates, um, using two-factor authentication, um, using password manager strategies like this, whereas non-experts mentioned a different set of things. They talked about password changes, they talked about using antivirus software, um, and they talked about only trying to visit only known websites to them. Um, there's a 2009 paper by Don Norman um, where he talks a bit about usable security and presents some kind of anecdotal evidence about password management. He says he talked to a bunch of security experts at a conference and he said that what most people told them was they used two passwords, one strong, one weak, and that they wrote down um, ones that didn't fit into this. So in our study, um, we wanted to do a kind of principled examination of what expert users do. So we um, conducted semi-structured interviews 
with computer security experts. Each of them lasted about 30 minutes and we audio recorded them so that we could later um, take notes and transcribe quotes from them. We recruited 15 participants. Um, Defining expertise is a little bit iffy, so we decided to go for a really safe approach. We recruited people from security groups at my current university, there are three of them, um, as well as um, some practitioners from industry. Out of these 15 people, 13 of them had graduate degrees in computer security, and I believe that the number has now increased to 14. Um, all of them were employed as researchers or practitioners in information security. Um, maybe roughly in line with the distribution in this room, 13 of our participants were male, two were female, and they were probably on the kind of young side. Um, their median age in our interviews was 29. Our interview asked um, a bunch of questions about how people manage their passwords. We specifically did not ask people what their passwords were. We were very clear about this to people, not that people wanted to share their passwords, particularly experts. Um, so we, we asked more about how, um, what you do. We asked about how many passwords do you have? We asked how many accounts do you have? We tried to encourage people to really think about their answers. Um, so for instance, in the question about how many accounts do you have, we broke it down into uh, almost 20 categories. And rather than saying, how many accounts do you have, we said, how many email accounts do you have? How many travel-related accounts do you have? How many online gaming accounts do you have? Um, to try to get people to really reflect on like, their accounts, their practices, um, and to go through and try and give us more accurate answers, hopefully. We asked questions about how people choose passwords and create new accounts. What are their practices around that? Um, and we also explored other scenarios, uh, changing and resetting, forgetting passwords, that kind of thing. And so this yielded us two data sets. Um, one was a sort of quantitative set of descriptive um, responses, the sort of numbers that people gave us to these questions. How many passwords do you have? How many passwords do you reuse, et cetera? Um, and what is really the more interesting data set, the qualitative data set of people's discussion, um, their detailed responses. Um, and I'll spend most of the talk um, discussing those. So, but to give an overview of the quantitative data, um, in our study, experts reported having a median of 64 accounts and 58 passwords. So this is substantially higher than what we saw in our earlier interviews with end users, um, and is substantially higher than um, the numbers found in the literature, which are often more on the order of sort of um, 10 or 12 accounts and five passwords. Um, that work is mostly quite out of date, um, but this is really a lot higher. As I say, people were very private about what, they, what their passwords actually were, and we encouraged them in that privacy. Um, but people talked about having a kind of algorithmic strategy around generating passwords if they were doing it out of their head. 80% um, of our participants in our studies said that they reused passwords. So, this is very high, given that we're often encouraging people as experts not to reuse passwords. Um, however, people clearly had a small number of reused passwords. Um, the median was three and a half. And everybody in our study who said that they reused passwords um, was really careful to follow up with, yes, but not everywhere. You know, they, they discussed careful strategies and um, sort of clear ways of segmenting uh, accounts into reused or not, and I'll talk more about that later. Again, 80% of our participants said that they used a password manager, and I'm defining manager very broadly here. I'm including passwords saved in browser managers, in managers here. Um, of these 80%, half of them um, said that they used dedicated password management software in some form or another, but out of people who did, none said that they used their managers exclusively which was kind of surprising to me. I thought we would get people who were big believers. And so as I was saying, there's the numbers from, the, from people's responses, um, but really what was most interesting was the way they talked about it, the, the detailed descriptions of their password management strategies. And so we audio recorded those and went back and um, took notes and transcribed parts of them. And we conducted a thematic analysis 
of this. Um, so this is a flexible qualitative um, analysis method um, that let us sort of try to draw out themes and relationships and to kind of identify a bigger pattern of what was going on in here. So for this analysis, we followed the process of open coding where we traversed our data line by line, um, looking for codes, trying to understand what was happening in that specific instance. Um, and then we took our codes, of which there were 30, and we manipulated them. We put them on post-it notes, we put them on a whiteboard, uh, we drew you know, clouds and thoughts around them. We tried to, to find a pattern in them. And we came up with four themes. Our first theme was expert awareness. And this sounds intuitive, but experts had really consistent pre-planned strategies. And this contrasted really strongly with our earlier interviews, where it was clear that non-experts did not. Um, experts, we asked the same question a couple times in the interviews. And the non-experts, when they got to a question about resetting a password, which is essentially choosing a new password, said things like, oh, yeah, I don't know how I do it then. I, I kind of panic, you know, uh. um, But experts said things to us like, I already answered this question. You know, they were very clear on what were the same events. They had consistent plan strategies for them. They were also aware of specific threats. Obviously, they work in information security. I would hope that they are. But they discussed it in relation to their own personal password management strategies. In this quote, um, this participant says, well, you know, there's been a couple of incidents. Like, uh, well, my laptop got stolen. And uh, you know, you hear serious vulnerability, um, heart bleed. And you know, that's when you think, eh, this might be a time to change some passwords. Um, and they also planned for failure. They seemed to have um, consistent strategies about what to do when things went wrong, which the non-experts didn't. Um, the non-experts talked about being uncomfortable, about panicking. Um, but experts didn't seem to go down those roads. However, one of the big problems with passwords is that we don't live in an ideal world, that there are all kinds of social and contextual pressures. You know, wanting to log into your email so you can show your mom a picture of your latest vacation. Um, things like this, situations that you can't foresee. Um, and experts were affected by these too. And, and in this second quote, the guy says, well, I can be as paranoid as I want, but in the real world I have a family and stuff, so. I have to compromise. Uh, and then he went on to discuss um, how he changes his own personal password management strategy um, to share accounts with his wife, because basically he can't expect her to sort of live up to high standards. Another theme that came up was a combination of strategies. As I said earlier, 80% of people use some kind of password manager. 40% of people use dedicated password management software. Uh, but people also said that they used, 80% of people reused passwords in some way or another. And I was surprised by this. I thought that people would be sort of true believers in one strategy, but it, it seemed that most people used a combination of strategies. And the combination that came up most often was using a dedicated password manager for important accounts and reusing um, a password, often what sounded like a comparatively lame password, if I can be honest. Um, on other accounts. Um, in this quote, um, this participant describes why he doesn't put everything in his password manager. He starts out by saying, oh, yeah, it's kind of inconvenient. But when it comes down to it, he says, like, there's an investment to store in the password manager. And, and also, he doesn't kind of want to get his password manager dirty with all of his low importance accounts. That he prefers to have a kind of throwaway password that he, he reuses on things he doesn't care about. But he likes to keep his password manager nice. It's for important accounts. And related to this, um, this kind of segmentation, what goes into the password manager or what gets the good password generation algorithm, um, you know, what strategy do you do where, is this kind of theme that came up about a personal assessment of risk, that there aren't good ways in security of knowing exactly how much security is required. You know, it's hard to make an objective assessment, particularly as an end user of a service, about exactly what the threats and risks are, about exactly how to defend against them. And you don't get good feedback here either. You never know whether your account wasn't compromised because your password was so good or because your account wasn't compromised because no one ever tried to attack it. Um, and 
Experts really explicitly, and I think almost everybody in our study did this, they talked about this, this aspect of personal assessment. In this quote, the, the participant says, well, I have two passwords that are, and then he corrects himself. He says, well, that I consider to be more secure, and then I only use for a few things. But, but yeah, I consider them more valuable. And interestingly, I thought people, given they went down this road, would talk about the difficulty of making these personal assessments, but they didn't. They seemed very comfortable with it, but in the same breath seemed to acknowledge it very explicitly, which I, I thought was very interesting, that they knew that they were sort of having their own personal view on this and, and putting their personal judgment into it, but they as experts felt very comfortable with it. But as we could probably have guessed, experts make mistakes too, that usability problems lead experts to have problems. Um, <laughs> One person referred to assigned passwords as ridiculous strings of horror, <laughs> which made me laugh. And people had different ways of coping with this. Um, one thing that came up a couple times was people who tried to really minimize their online presence. In this quote, um, this participant says, well, I try to shove all, all my passwords and let my partner manage them. Uh, he said, you know, I, I keep track of the four or five that mad, matter to me. And then, you know, I, I let her go. And the thing is, it was clear that sometimes these usability problems lead experts to make mistakes. Um, we had more than one participant tell us that they picked um, passwords by using dictionary words from their native language. And this is a fallacy. It's no harder to search dictionaries in other languages than English, even if we primarily work in English. Um, the other thing that people talked about doing was guessing repeatedly at their passwords. Um, and these things are hard to avoid. You know, that the passwords are really awkward. I think we all know this, that there's nothing fun about passwords. They're difficult. So, experts versus non-experts. I was really surprised when I did these interviews. I thought that experts would look dramatically different than the non-experts we had earlier interviewed. And when I went and I conducted these interviews, my first thought was, oh my god, they're exactly the same. I was, I was quite surprised by this. I, I was shocked. Um, this sort of segmentation using um, old passwords. In, in both of our sets of interviews, people talked about having had their passwords for a long time. I was... Um, I laughed when our previous speaker said they didn't know what his first password is because my interviews would lead me to believe that most people are still using their first password in some form or another. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's been you know, kind of manipulated or changed over the years that people talked about passwords, both experts and non-experts, going back a long way. It's like this kind of emotional attachment to those passwords. Um, and they're still using them on low importance accounts. But for high importance accounts, um, the experts were using password managers, they were using the generation function within password managers, um, but they were very clear that they weren't doing this everywhere. This was not like their password strategy, this was their important password strategy. Um, and interestingly, we, we saw non-experts trying to do the same thing, but non-experts seemed not to do it as effectively. Um, so we think that this careful segmentation, there didn't seem to be nearly as much blurry middle for the, the experts as there was for the non-experts. Um, is how users, well, sorry, expert users um, are more successful at managing passwords than non-experts. But the question is sort of, how do experts achieve this success, you know? As I was saying earlier, like, these, these are cognitive tasks. And what makes an expert an expert? We were careful to choose people who had high knowledge of the domain, but if you look at the literature around expertise, um, it's usually defined as having high knowledge and high success. And it's usually talked about in things like tennis. So in tennis, to be a tennis expert, you have to know a lot about tennis and you have to win a lot of matches. But how do you win security matches? You know, as I was saying earlier, you don't get a lot of feedback. You don't have any sort of evidence of success. How do you, how do you measure that success? Um, and so it turns out that the literature also says that expertise comes from skilled decision making, particularly in these kind of ill-structured problems where success isn't very clear. And so situation awareness is the perception of elements in, 
in the environment within a volume of time and space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their status into the near future. And situation awareness means having learned knowledge and skills, with, which experts obviously have. It means having schemas for prototypical situations, understanding what these prototypical situations are going to be. And it was clear in our interviews that people did. They, they'd really thought through the idea that they were going to have to reset forgotten passwords, that there were going to be situations where incidents came up. And they knew what they did. It means having mental models of the domain. People, the experts in our study certainly did. And having automatic processes for those, this domain. And I would say that security experts had all of those. And I think that this is really what allows security experts to be password management experts. And so as I was saying, one of our goals is to help end users improve their password management techniques. And, and hopefully, the expert approach would help us um, come up with some ideas here. And so it occurs to me that one thing we need to do is help non-expert users become more situationally aware. Um, and I have a couple of ideas about how we can do this. I think that um, making a little bit more information available would be very helpful to end users. Um, we had multiple people, both experts and non, tell us about the frustration of thinking up a good password, memorizing it, typing it in, and having it rejected by the password policy. There's no reason not to have those rules on the front page, that we're not winning a lot of security by obscuring them, and we're causing a lot of usability problems. I also think that website log information should be available. Online banking sometimes does this, where you can click in and see to a different interface and see when people last logged in. Um, but in our earlier interview, something that came up was people said, well, I think I got hacked, but I didn't really know how to tell, so uh, I wasn't really sure what to do about it. Um, and so if there was somewhere that they could go in and sort of see if they were the last person to log in, this could be a way of um, addressing this. We also think that, we also think, I also think, that we should be encouraging the use of easily adopted strategies. And one of the things that I really think we should be pushing is password managers. And I know that there are password manager people in this room, so I think it's going to be an easy sell. Um, but one thing I really like about them in the context of situation awareness is that they provide this centralized place to think about your passwords, to see how many accounts you have, to see how many passwords you have. Um, I know LastPass and 1Password have kind of security audit or watchtower, I think it's called in 1Password, um, features that do a kind of assessment of the overall security. And I think that most non-experts are really missing a place to think about the bigger picture. Experts were better about thinking about the bigger picture, but I suspect that they could benefit from these kinds of tools as well. Um, single sign-on would also fit into this, um, but I think that it's harder for end users to try and adopt single sign-on. Like it's sort of, it's up to the website to provide a single sign-on, but an end user can have a lot of control over whether or not they use a password manager, which is why I think that it's probably the answer. However, password managers, they're really frustrating to adopt, to set up, to migrate to, and I would love to see those issues addressed um, because I think that would really help. And finally, this is kind of a high level point, but I think we need to discuss the real risks and the corresponding defenses for users. Um, this is kind of a joke, this is a real product. But in our, in our non-expert interviews, people wrote their passwords down but didn't store them securely. And so this is kind of a joke and you know, I would advocate for it more strongly if it didn't say the password logbook across the front. But ultimately, I think it's way safer to have this in your purse than to store your password list in Dropbox. You know, this is not the world's worst idea, that if we can emphasize the real defenses for plausible risks to people and give better heuristics. I got a number of non-experts telling me in our interviews that they had stopped using browser-based managers because somebody had told them that it wasn't secure. And, okay, it's not a great idea to save your banking password if you're concerned about, I don't know, your son breaking into your bank account and spending all your money, but you should absolutely save your logins to the Globe and Mail in your browser if it you know, it makes your life easier. Um, and this kind of already came up, but there are problems that aren't addressed by situation awareness, by expert knowledge. Um, one thing that came up repeatedly in our expert interviews was password changes. People talked about how time-consuming they were, how awkward it was. 
Um, and they also affect the usability of password managers because one of the benefits of password managers is that you should be able to change your passwords to randomly generated ones and have them saved by the accounts. But going through this process is just awful, finding the thing, changing it, copying and pasting, you know, we all know. And a kind of lurking theme that came up was around password manager usability. Why aren't people who already use them using them for everything else? I mean, this person in my earlier quote talked about wanting to keep his database clean, but he also kind of hinted at the inconvenience, the extra effort. Um, and, and I'm not sure what the answer is here, but I think there's something going on there. And so, in conclusion, um, I think we need to support all users. Experts are users, too. Um, we need to help people develop tools to increase situation awareness um, and address the remaining usability issues. So, thank you very much. And I can take questions.